Hi, my name is Mark Sign. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the evening services of our church for Sunday, April the 9th. This is Easter Sunday. We will sing uh, several songs. We will, of course, observe the Lord's Supper and I have a message for you that I hope will uh, help us all to understand a little bit more about what God has planned for each one of us. We sing here at Northfield from Songs of Faith and Praise. I will give you the number of the song, and I'll also give you the name of the song. So if you don't happen to have that book, you can either Google it or use the book that you have and maybe be able to sing along uh, with me. I do not have Jane with me. She is in Kansas visiting family. And so I'm going to carry out uh, the song service by myself as well as I can. If you would turn to number 346, I serve a risen Savior. 346, I serve a risen Savior. <clears throat> I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. <clears throat> In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. <clears throat> he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. <clears throat> you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Our next song will be, uh, Let Me Be a Sacrifice. Let me be a sacrifice. And that is number 246. 246. Let me be a sacrifice. <clears throat> Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice consumed in your praise. 
Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice, worshiping your name. And our song before the Lord's Supper is number 350, When My Love for Christ Grows Weak. 350, When My Love for Christ Grows Weak. We'll sing the first four verses. The first four verses. When My Love for Christ Grows Weak. When my love for Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to thee, Garden of Gethsemane. There I walk amid the shades, while the lingering twilight veins see the suffering friendless one <clears throat> weeping praying there alone <clears throat> when my love for man grows weak when for stronger faith i seek Hill of Calvary I go, to thy scenes of fear and woe. <clears throat> there behold his agony, suffered on the bitter tree. See his anguish, see his death, love triumphant still in death. This is the time that we gather about the Lord's table to remember the Lord's death uh, and his burial and, of course, his resurrection, especially fitting on this day, this Easter Sunday. It's a deeper faith that we are indeed seeking when we come about the Lord's table. We, um, we think of the agony that he suffered on the tree. We see his anguish. Yet through all of that, uh, we look and we see Jesus's great faith. Even though he would have liked that cup to be passed from him, he knew that it was the will of the Father that he would go to the cross and die for the sins of men. And so we come about the Lord's table and we take this into our hearts. We remember exactly what God's plan was for us, that at the right time, he sent Jesus to us. He didn't send Jesus into, into a pure uh, world that, that in which there was no sin. He sent Jesus to sinful men that he might be able to teach them and reconcile them back to the Lord, that sinful man through him might have the opportunity to live eternally with him and God in heaven. So as we gather about the table, we see the two emblems before us. We see the bread and we see the fruit of the vine. In Matthew 28, and in 1 Corinthians uh, 11, it uh, lays out for us what the bread is all about and what the fruit of the vine is all about. When he took the bread, he said, take, eat, this is my body. Let's pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we come about your table and we remember the body of your son as it was nailed to the cross and he suffered that physical agony, knowing that the agony that he suffered was to be the perfect sacrifice one time for each one of us. We thank you for that great plan that you had. And we thank you so much that Jesus was willing to go through uh, uh, with your plan and die on the cross. 
as we partake of this bread, we think of his body. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. Then Jesus said, take this cup, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. As we partake, let's remember that. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Our Heavenly Father, help us to remember that this fruit of the vine represents the blood of the new covenant, which Jesus poured out for us. We know that through the life-giving blood that flowed from his body, that we have redemption and that we have forgiveness of our sins. It's only through that blood that our sins can be washed away. Help us as we gather about this table to remember the sacrifice, remember the blood that he shed. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And as the Lord's Supper is completed, we also know on the Lord's Day that we are expected, according to 1 Corinthians 16, to lay by and store that which we have prospered and give it back to the Lord. Remembering, as the epistle of James tells us, that all good gifts, everything that we have comes from above. And so knowing that uh, everything that we do have uh, is not our own. We know that when we pass from this earth, that nothing will, nothing physical will be left. We know that uh, we are to give of our means so that your word can be spread. I just pray that uh, those that uh, utilize these funds will do so with that in mind. We also uh, pray that we can be a benevolent group and that we can help those in need. Let's pray for the giving. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, you have given us the ability to give. We understand through your word that you love a cheerful giver. You love one who gives uh, from his heart or her heart. We're reminded of the widow that put in the two small coins and that was what she had. She gave all back to the Lord. We're not asked to give all of our means back to the Lord, but as we have prospered, help us to do so with gratitude, with joyousness. We pray this in his most holy name, amen. The last song that we'll sing before the lesson is number 508, 580, The Joy of the Lord. <clears throat> 580, The Joy of the Lord. <clears throat> the joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I certainly enjoyed singing. How be it? Singing by myself, I'm not used to that. Uh, I know that the Lord accepted these songs of praise and accepted them in the vein in which they were given, praising our God from whom all blessings flow. 
Last week, if you remember, uh, my title was very simple. The title was Salt. Salt, a Christian value. It is a Christian value uh, because uh, Jesus told us uh, very, very specifically that we are the salt of the earth. Uh, and as the salt of the earth, we are to be the seasoning. We are to uh, utilize those characteristics of salt in our lives to be what the Lord wants us to be. If you were there this morning, you heard that the title of my lesson is According to the Need of the Moment. According to the Need of the Moment. You know, moments in our lives very often revolve around the things that we say. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, Let your speech also be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Now, if you remember from last week, uh, we've heard the expression, He's worth his salt. And that's going all the way back to when salt was a very, very valuable commodity. Sometimes workers were paid in salt. Sometimes salt, an ounce of salt, could be exchanged for an ounce of gold. That's how valuable salt was. But we're taking this to the next level. Now I'm going to go back and tell you a story that uh, is etched in my memory. About 12 or 13 years ago, uh, uh, probably not that long, about 10 years ago, Jane and I and uh, our sister and brother, Lloyd Lane and Larry, went on one of our vacations. And this time we went to the British Isles. And uh, when we went to the British Isles, there was one particular time in Ireland. And, and by the way, we rented a car out a good part of the time. Learning how to drive on the left side of the road was uh, a, a, uh, a real kick. But this one time in Ireland, we uh, took a taxi cab. Now, <laughs> I'm funny about this. And when I travel with people, uh, for example, like this little small four-person entourage, uh, the three of them get in the back seat and I do what I really enjoy. I sit in the front seat with the driver. Uh, I always like to kibitz with the driver and chit chat and, you know, um, very often I get some insight into who they are and what they're all about. Well, I'm here to tell you that this Irish driver was salty. <laughs> My, from the back seat, they couldn't understand all that he was saying, but as he was describing things there, uh, in Dublin, uh, it was, uh, let me say, I'm, I'm trying to say it delicately, but there's no real way for me to say it. His speech was laced with profanity. And so with that in mind, I want to turn to the other side of this. Sometimes when someone speaks like that, we say that their speech is salty. We don't say that they're worth their salt. We say that their speech is salty. But see, this is the opposite of what the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 4, 6. He said, let your speech also be with grace as though seasoned with salt. The, the good part of what salt is all about. The salt that... Uh, Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 when he said to his disciples that they are to be the salt of the earth. And with that in mind, those words come down through history to each one of us. And I truly believe that Jesus meant 
that you and I are to be the salt of the earth. In other words, it's good for the earth that Christians are a part of the world because we're the salt of the earth. And with that, the words that come from our mouths should reflect that. The words that come from our mouth, which is always in the company of others, is such that when they hear our speech, they'll know what we are all about. Our speech will reflect our Christian values. Hmm. Is that true? I challenge you uh, just to make sure that that when you speak, that that your speech is seasoned with Christian values. Don't get edgy. I mean, your speech doesn't have to be prof profanity-laced to not be wholesome to God. It should be with that salt that seasons it, with the salt that Jesus talked about when he said that we are to be the salt of the earth. Now, with that in mind, let's look at the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. He said, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such is as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Hence, what my title was all about, according to the need of the moment. Why does he say that? Because we live in the moment, don't we? We live in the moment. If you are listening to this, you are in the moment, right? You're in the moment. When you're eating your breakfast, you're in the moment. When you're getting ready to go to work or go out to exercise, you're in the moment. When you are at worship service, you are in the moment. And with that in mind, when you speak to others, you are in the moment. You have no other moment but that moment that you're in. And so it goes without saying that when the Apostle Paul utters these words, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of what? The need of the moment. Why? Because it will give grace to those that hear, because they are hearing in the moment. That means that nothing unwholesome, nothing filthy, nothing corrupt should come out of our mouths. Now, you know what? The, the first thing that we think of are people who cuss, people who swear, people who give oaths, but you know what? It's much, much more than that. I would expect that as Christians, these things are not part of our persona. Profanity is not part of what makes us up. Example, when we criticize someone in a negative way, all right? When we criticize someone in a negative way, it can be unwholesome. It can be corrupt speech. It may not have any curse words in it. There may not be any profanity in it. But it is nonetheless unwholesome communication. And this should be purged from our minds and our mouths. 
let's make sure we get this. It may be at the center of this lesson this evening. The real definition of unwholesome. Remember, Paul said, let nothing unwholesome come from your mouth. The definition of unwholesome in this scripture is any word that's not good for edification according to the need of the moment. Rather than unwholesome communication, let's use speech that builds people up rather than tearing them down. We, we said earlier that salt means that it's good for the world that we're there. And with that in mind, seasoning our speech with salt means that it is the, is for the good of those around us to hear what we're saying. We need to spread the gospel of Christ in a wholesome manner. The message of the saving grace of Jesus Christ is included. And when we, when we communicate with others, help others to see that we are Christ-like. It even goes to the simplest, thank you. The simplest holding the door open for someone. The simplest, hello. How are you? And with meaning, um, those of you that know me know that I'm a communication person. I, I, I love to talk with people. I was at a place getting some food yesterday and there was a man sitting there and we just started to chat and, um, uh, and, uh, we just exchanged, I, I guess, uh, personal talk. And I, I asked what he did, and he said he was a teacher. And with that, I told him I was a retired teacher. And he asked me what I taught, and I said I taught science. And then he said that he taught physics and chemistry, and so we were kindred brothers. Then came the clincher. He said to me, Don't you have trouble reconciling science with your Christianity? Wow. And I said, not in the least. Because I shared with him that after I'd retired from teaching, I became a minister. That's what precipitated his question. All right, doesn't it bother you that you can't reconcile science with Christianity? And so I said, certainly not. And then I said, you know what? If you know everything and, and you understand science, physics, chemistry, if you understand even the law of conservation of matter, which all matter comes from other matter, or the law of conservation of energy, all energy comes from other energy, it's just kind of recycled and reused. I said, as a Christian and as a scientist, I know that something cannot come from nothing. And what that tells me is that somebody bigger and better than myself started it. That's why science and religion, science and my Christian faith do not come at loggerheads with one another. I think that kind of impressed him. He asked me, well, where do you preach? And he was from the area. Uh, I explained where we were. I gave him my card. I told him we were the building alongside of Temple Bethel. And he knew where we were. Who knows? He may show up. Only because I think that my speech was seasoned with salt. And so with that in mind, the next time you're sitting at a traffic light and the left turn lane goes on and little old lady in the car in front of you isn't turning, 
don't go ballistic. Don't lay on the horn until uh, the horn won't blow anymore. Try to think of something else. You know what? Maybe it's close to 1030 in the morning and you don't want to miss breakfast at McDonald's and miss that sauce and egg, egg McMuffin. Try imagining that she may have a lot on your her mind just like you may have a lot on your mind. Let your patience take the front instead of your blaring on the horn. Try the same thing next time you have the opportunity to speak to someone perhaps who has been rude to you. And in the need of the moment, and remember, this is in the need of the moment, speak something to that person that lifts him up rather than hurts him. You know, in dealing with one another, it seems to always be a tit for a tat. If they say something bad, you must one-up them. Weigh the need of the moment because we are in the moment according to the need of the moment. What you find is that the healing and the edification happens to you as much maybe as the one that you have been blessed to talk to because you will know that you said the right thing and in the right vein. You will know about it. You will reflect Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it will give grace to those that hear. Think about that next time you communicate with someone rather than lose your patience. Say something that you will probably later be sorry for. I hope this message was uplifting, uh, as uplifting to you as it was for me as I prepared it for you. I pray that uh, our, our language, our speech will be seasoned with salt so that those around us will know that we are what Jesus calls the salt of the earth as Christians. And that will be reflected in the things that we say. If you are not a child of God, we offer you the invitation this evening to come to the Lord. You never know when you plant a seed. You never know when you exchange uh, thoughts with someone with a with a, a speech seasoned with salt, and you make a good impression upon them. I pray that we have done that, and maybe uh, I made an impression on you tonight, and you know that you need to come to Jesus. If you need to confess Jesus as the Son of God, repent of your former life, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. We offer you that opportunity this evening. If you need that, get in touch with one of us. We will be there to help you. Let's close this with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, bless us as we walk through our lives. Help us to reflect the fact that we are Christians. Help us to be proud of being Christians. Help us to remember what it really means that we are disciples of the one who died for our sins. We are disciples of the one who not only died for our sins, but rose on the third day. And as today is Easter Sunday, we remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us to remember that resurrection in such a positive way to understand that that resurrection gives us hope that we will be resurrected one day to live with you. Bless us in our lives, dear Heavenly Father, that we may live godly, that our speech would be seasoned with salt, that we would indeed always understand that we are in the moment and use that moment for you. Bless us, continue to be with us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. One thing I